first sing a song. How many of you guys know Victory in Jesus? It's a good song. Let's start out singing that. I can't hear in this year, so this should go well, all right? Sing this together. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood And I seated. We are so excited tonight to start out a new series called Christ Return, Living with the End in Mind. And there's a lot of stuff, new things happening all around the building. If you think, wow, it seems a little sparse in here tonight, I don't think it's too bad. Actually, we have about 30 to uh, 35 adults uh, in discipleship groups all over the building. Like, there's probably, I think, five or six groups going on this evening. We also have Grief Share going on, which is really cool um, for adults. We also have the teens who are meeting and uh, children's uh, ministries going on, nurseries. So lots of stuff happening. And is that exciting? I'm excited about that. A lot of great things happening. In those discipleship groups, people are getting together and studying God's Word together and memorizing Scripture and just growing like crazy. So we're real excited about that. We're going to do a little bit different uh, for the next few weeks. What we're going to do is start out with a, a song real quick, and then we'll get right into the teaching. And then at about 40 uh, after, um, I will wrap up my teaching. We'll see. I'll try. And uh, we'll wrap that up, and then the stream will stop. The uh, live stream will stop, so you all will be done with us uh, that are watching us online. And then we'll have a time uh, for prayer. How, who believes prayer is important? Amen? I think prayer is so important. And I also know that uh, we want to share requests with each other. Sometimes uh, when we do that, if, there's, if people know the Internet's going and we're talking about prayer requests, maybe you'll be re less likely to turn those in. So we're going to we're going to. Uh, shut down the live stream. We're going to share prayer requests. Actually, as you came in, hopefully you got um, a prayer list. You got a handout for tonight's lesson. If you have a prayer request, uh, gr there's a little slip that you can grab. They're there at the back. Um, and uh, in fact, Brother Roy and Brother Bill, would you guys grab some of those slips? And if anybody has a prayer request you'd like to turn in, of course, it won't go on the internet, but we will have it here. If you have a prayer request you'd like to put on the prayer list, if you'd raise your hand right now, uh, you can do that. You don't have to. Um, but, of course, nobody needs prayer. Amen. No one needs prayer. Amen. Okay. Well, good. I'm totally joking. I'm guilting you into it. But anyway, uh, make sure that you get one of those and turn those in, and we'll do that at the end of the service. If you have your Bibles, grab those. We're going to be in Matthew chapter number 
24, but we're going to kind of go beyond that a little bit tonight um, here in the study. I remember growing up thinking about the, the return of Christ and his second coming when I was a kid. Uh, I was a PK, and so being a preacher's kid, uh, we would spend a lot of time at the church. And this was before we had things like the internet and video games. We were too cheap to have Game Boys and all that. And so I would be up at the church and I would have time on my hands. And so I would go look at my dad's library and I would look at, of course, when you're a kid, you're looking for the ones with pictures. And I remember this book and I'm going to, I'll show you this. It's, called, it's a book by a guy named Clarence Larkin and it's called Dispensational Truth. And I thought it was a cool book because it had pictures and the pictures are kind of crazy. I mean, look at that. You can't hardly see it from back there. But doesn't that look interesting? When I was like nine years old, I thought that was so cool. And uh, there's dragons and snakes and leopards. It's kind of crazy. Um, so when I think about end time stuff, like that was some of my earliest memories. The other, the other thing that would happen is it would come up in church from time to time. How many of you guys have ever been to church where they have prophecy conferences, talking about end time stuff? Yeah. And I remember thinking as a kid, especially um, when I was a teenager, um, I remember thinking, God, please don't come back until I grow up. I, wa I, wanted to, I wanted to grow up. I wanted to get married. I wanted to have kids. I wanted to get out of the house. Now that I have kids, I'm like, Jesus, come back. We want you. Any day now, right? No, I'm joking. But, you know, as a, as a Christian, you think about the prophecy, you think about the second coming and revelation and all of these different things like that. And um, we can have a lot of different emotions when we think about Jesus' return. We Maybe, maybe people don't want Christ to come back yet because you're enjoying life and there's some things you want to do. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you don't want Christ to come back yet because there's someone who you want to see come to know Christ. Is there anybody that you would love to see come to know Jesus? Yeah, and that's a good, that's a good thing. We want people to know Christ and to be right with God, get saved. But then some people, maybe they look at the news or maybe they're going through something difficult and they think, God, when are you going to come back and make all this stuff right? Have you ever thought that before? God, why, why are you letting this go on and on? Why is there so much injustice in the world? We know you're going to come and make things right, so why aren't you doing it? Or maybe you even think as you get older, man, God, could you just take me to heaven now? Another emotion that we can have about end times prophecy is, man, it's just so confusing. There's so much there. There's and so much of it is weird. You read Revelation and there's all the stuff I was showing you, right? There's dragons and leopards and Babylon and harlots. And I mean, it's just kind of, there's all kinds of stuff in there. And of course, it covers Daniel and Zechariah. Some of the books you probably skip over during the year round Bible reading. You get to some of those places like, oh, I'll just skip and go back to the New Testament, right? Because it can be kind of daunting. And so... Um, it can be confusing, it, but the truth of the matter is that a significant portion of the Bible is prophecy. A large portion of the Bible is prophecy. Uh, a significant part of that prophecy has already been fulfilled. Let me say that again. There's a lot of prophecy in the Bible that's already been fulfilled. You can trust your Bible for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons you can trust your Bible is because it's already has, it already has an incredible track record of predicting what will happen, and that stuff happening exactly the way that the Bible said it would happen. That's pretty cool. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, maybe you're here tonight and someone invited you, and I want you to know that the Bible is true, and one of the ways you can know it's true is because it's really accurate where it predicts things. A significant part of the prophecy has been fulfilled. And the prophecy about Jesus' second coming in the scripture is there so that we can know it, so that we can understand it, and so that we can live in light of this truth that Jesus Christ is coming back. And that when he comes back, he's going to restore and make things right. And eventually, there will be a new heaven and a new earth and life is going to be amazing. And God's going to do that for us. 
There are things he taught us that, though, that we need to know about. And a significant teaching from Jesus on the topic of his second coming is found in the book of Matthew in chapters 24 and 25. And it's called the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse. And for the next six or so weeks, we're going to basically walk through Matthew chapter 24 and 25. It was a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples, specifically uh, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Those four guys are named as people that, that he had this conversation with. But to really understand prophecy, to really understand, well, actually, the truth of the matter is to understand any scripture, when you're doing Bible interpretation, context is king. Knowing who is uh, speaking, when they are speaking, who they are speaking to, what those people would have understood uh, by what was being said at the, at the time that it's being said, all of those things are absolutely critical to getting the interpretation of the passage correct. Um, so many times, I, I, just the other day I was in uh, a passage and I was really confused. I'm like, well, this thing and this thing and what about that and what about that? And I was like, I know that can't be the right interpretation because the Bible says over here this. And I just, it's something I teach all the time, context is king. And I remember getting so confused, I called my dad. I said, dad, and he asked me one question. And the question he asked was, well, who was his audience? And right when I heard that question, who was his audience, and I understood, okay, what would they have understood him to say? Man, the whole thing cleared up. The whole passage made sense because we got the right context. And so tonight, really, the first sermon I'm going to give in this series is setting the context for where this particular discussion took place because Jesus is going to give an answer. Really, all of the whole Matthew 24 and 25 is Jesus answering a question, or actually a couple of questions, that the disciples asked at a particular time and in a particular place. And so that's what we're going to do. Tonight I'm going to give you the context so that we make sure we interpret his answer correctly because if you think he asked a different question that was asked, then you'll come up to with a different answer and see what he's talking about. You have the wrong thing that he's talking about. So this particular passage is found in Matthew. And I'm going to, you say, man, you're zooming out context big time. Yes, I am. Matthew is one of the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels because they largely give very similar uh, stories and backgrounds. It's obvious that they had similar source material. John is obviously, it's the same, same story, same Gospel, same truth, but it, there's a bunch of things that he includes that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not include, and it's a, it's a totally different thing. Matthew was clearly writing to a Jewish audience. Matthew was a Jew. He's writing this gospel with a Jewish reader in mind, okay? Matthew, uh, you say, well, how do you know that, Pastor Ben? Well, for instance, okay, Matthew talks a lot about the, the, the Jesus as the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. He talks a lot about Jesus as a king. He's trying to present him in that way. Matthew starts out in Matthew chapter 1 with Jesus' lineage, now, Jesus' lineage is important because God made a promise to somebody that the Messiah would come in his line. Who was that? You might know. Who, who did God promise that the Messiah would come in his line? David, the Davidic covenant. And so Matthew, right from the beginning, gives this lineage and says, Jesus is in the line of King David. A Jewish reader starting out in Matthew chapter 1, seeing that lineage right from the beginning, would understand he's trying to make a case that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. When there, there is that kind of a thing. So to understand this passage on this Olivet Discourse, we have to understand that Matthew has this Jewish reader in mind, and that's going to set the stage for exactly what he's trying to say. Now, to understand this passage on the Olivet Discourse, we have to set the stage. So here's my objective tonight. We can understand Jesus' teaching on the Olivet Discourse. That's just a fancy name for Ch Matthew chapter 24 and 25, where Jesus has this conversation on the Mount of Olives with these guys. 
We can understand this teaching at some level by understanding three perspectives that his audience, the disciples, had at the time of their discussion, this discussion, with Jesus. All right? So three perspectives are what I'm going to give you, and this is all going to set the stage for the entire conversation. Are you ready? You don't seem ready. Are you ready? Okay. I'm not Dr. Hiltabittle, but I'm going to try. Okay, here we go. Perspective number one, the disciples' view of eschatology. Really? That's the blank? Eschatology? Yes. Eschatology. E-S-C-H-A-T-O-L-O-G-Y. That is a fancy theological word that talks, the word means the theology about last things or end things. The word eschaton means last things. And so your eschatology is what you believe about how the world is basically going to end. What's going to happen at the last days. Okay? Now, the disciples, okay, this is going to blow your mind. You're going to have to write this down. Are you ready? The disciples were Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. They really were, all of them. They were all Jewish. And so these disciples, you, you, don't, you need to understand that the Jewish people were a proud people. By the time they got to uh, this time in history, of course, when Jesus shows up, when we start learning about Jesus and it, we go to, into Israel in, in the Gospels, what's going on in Israel What's going on in Israel that wasn't going on when the Old Testament ended? There's 400 silent years between uh, the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. And what was going on in between those times is that when we show up on the scene reading about Jesus, is that Jesus, uh, that Israel was being occupied by Rome. Correct. There were now Romans. They were an occupied people. They were a people under that submission. And so the disciples, uh, because of that, and because all that had happened with the Babylonian captivity and and other captivities, the things that they had dealt with, they got to this place now where Rome was in charge. There's these things called synagogues that popped up everywhere. And in these synagogues, there was, it it was essentially not just like a congregation, uh, a Jewish congregation, much like what would become the assembly, the church. But they also would educate. And so every uh, child that was a Jewish child in a city that had a synagogue, which was any city that had at least 10 uh, Jewish families in it, they would get their education primarily in the form of religious education. They would learn to read, and they would learn to read through the Old Testament. Okay? And so they understood, they would memorize whole parts of the Old Testament. They would memorize all kinds of the Old Testament. They would have been taught uh, theology. And they had a specific theology about the Jews understood the Old Testament and what the Old Testament says about the end times. Now the Old Testament says a lot about what's going to happen at the end of the world. It says a ton of things. And their theology would have been shaped by what the Old Testament says. Now, I don't know if you remember in Ephesians chapter 2, which we've been studying, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and then into the first part of Ephesians chapter 3, I want to let you know that I am a steward of this new thing, this mystery that God's now doing, this mystery called the, what was it? I'm The church. Mystery was this thing, this idea of something that was not previously revealed that's now being revealed. Are you with me? The Jews had no concept of the idea of the church or the church age. Jews saw Christ and God as the God of the Jews, the Messiah of the Jews, the word Christ is just the Greek word for Messiah. So when Jesus was called Jesus Christ, he was saying Jesus the Messiah, right? And so these these people would have seen basically the end of the world as this Jewish 
thing, right? Here's a few things that they would have understood. Uh, there is a book um, uh, that I will have to tell you the name of it later. I don't have it right in front of me, uh, the name of it. But it's by, you'll see my references at the top, in the, in the top of the thing. The guy named Schur, he, he wrote back in like 1919 a book talking about Jewish perspectives, um, the, the, the Jewish theology, the Jewish perspectives at the time of Christ. He did intense research, and he actually gave me this list. So these nine things, what was, I'm, I, I stole them from him, okay? I'm just being honest with you, okay? So that's me. Not plagiarism if I tell you who I got it from, right? So that, that's where I got it. If you want the, all the other references, maybe I should put up on the, uh, on the website. But this is basically what he said, and I think it's a really good summary of what the Jews would have believed, okay? Number one, the coming of the Messiah would be preceded by a time of terrible tribulation, okay? So they would have understood that when the Messiah comes, he's coming because things are bad, because there's bad things going on. Um, in, um, in Revelation, and you, there's parts of the Old Testament too, there's this kind of literature called apocalyptic literature. And there would have been some of that kind of literature in the Old Testament, and so they would have understood things to go very, very bad. Number two, they would have also understood that a forerunner was going to come to announce the coming Messiah. A forerunner, a forerunner announcing the com coming Messiah would appear in the midst of the tribulation. Okay? Number three, the Messiah would appear to establish his kingdom and to vindicate his people. Number four, the nations would form an alliance against the Messiah. You guys getting the blanks? Am I going too fast? Number five, the nations aligned against the Messiah would be destroyed. Who agrees? Jesus is going to win in the end. That's going to be cool, right? Number six, Jerusalem would be restored either by renovation or new Jerusalem from heaven. That's what they understood. Number seven, Jews scattered all over the world would be gathered back to Israel. Number eight, Messiah coming to Palestine would make it the center of the world and all the nations would be subjugated to the Lord. And then number nine, did I make you, did you miss it? Number, number eight, number nine, Messiah's kingdom would then continue as an eternal age of peace, righteousness, and divine glory. That's what they would have understood. Honestly, namely, largely they get what's going to happen at the end of the world right. The Messiah is going to return, and he is going to vindicate his people. Israel will be gathered back to Jerusalem and to Palestine. Jesus Christ will rule and reign physically, bodily, on the throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years, and then the end will come, and we will rule and reign with Jesus. Amen? That's what's going to happen. What they thought, that, so, so that's, that was what the Jewish mind, now here's, Interesting. Interestingly, think about those nine things. I put those first. I th put this perspective first because now we're going to look at the context of Matthew chapter 24 from the eyes of the disciples. We're going to come back to those nine things. And I want to point out some things to you, okay? When we get to Matthew chapter, say, 21, which is the week before... Matthew 24 and 25, this all of it discourse happens during the week leading up to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? So this is at the end of his earthly ministry before he goes to the cross, before he's resurrected. Are you with me? If you go to Matthew, so this is perspective number two. Perspective number one is, what was the typical Jew at the time of Jesus thinking about what's going to happen at the end? Those are nine summary statements. I will agree, who understands and agrees with me? There are probably Jews that didn't believe this. Okay? Just like there may be people that come to church here that may not believe everything that I believe. Are you with me? There may be people 
in the, but this was a basic understanding of what a typical Jewish Gentile would believe, including the disciples, the people having this conversation with Jesus. Perspective number two, the disciples' view then of Jesus' ministry. By this time, let me ask you a question. By the time of the triumphal entry, by this time, did the disciples believe that Jesus was the Messiah? Yeah, they did. Um, there's, there's, at, that, at some point, Jesus looks at the disciples and says, well, who do people say that I am? Right? Well, some people think that you're Elijah or John the Baptist. Well, who do you say that I am? I say, you're Jesus, the Son of God. And Jesus says, hey, on this rock I'll build my church. You're, you're Peter and on this rock I'll build my church. Like, they were rec- flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, Simon Barjona. From this time, you're going to be called Peter and on this rock I'll build my church. So they understood that Jesus was the Messiah and they completely believed that. Let's look at the, cut, the, the chapters leading up to Matthew 24, okay? If you go to Matthew chapter 21, you see at the beginning of the week, Jesus' triumphal entry, okay? The, dis- the disciples were there. Look at verse uh, Matthew 21, 1, okay? And when they drew nigh to Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage up to the Mount, Mount of, what Mount? Mount of Olives, okay, there you go. Then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto him, unto them, Go into the village against you, and straightway you'll find an ass tied and a colt with her to loose, and loose them and bring them to me. And if any man shall say aught to you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. And all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Here was the prophecy. Are we talking about prophecy? This is a prophecy that's now being fulfilled, right? Verse 5, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, Thy king cometh unto thee. There you go. You see the king? What's, Messiah, what's Matthew trying to present Jesus as? King and Messiah. Here's a messianic, kingly prof- prophecy. Jesus riding on a donkey, riding on the, uh, the ass here. Verse 5. Tell you the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto me, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the full of an ass, and the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the colt and put them on their clothes. And they set him thereon, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitude that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, which means what? Save us now, we pray. Were they saying, Save us now from our sins? and eternal salvation? No. This was eschatological language. They're saying, you're the Messiah. We've been seeing you do all these amazing things, and now you're fulfilling a prophecy that we know about. You're coming in as the Messiah King. Hosanna to the, what? Son of David. What are they saying? We recognize that you're in the line of David, which is exactly what the Old Testament said would the Messiah would be a part of. Now you're coming in writing like a king. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. That phrase, we're going to see later in just a few minutes, that phrase is even a phrase that's connected to the Messiah. Okay, we'll see that in a minute. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming, so, yeah, keep going. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? And the the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Didn't quite get it right. But then you go right from this triumphal entry, this Messiah coming to save his people. That was their perspective. The disciples would have been there saying, and that's, He's fulfilling, he's saying something about himself. He's fulfilling prophecy. Verse, then he goes right to the temple, verse 12. And Jesus went to the temple of God and cast out all that was sold and bought in the temple, overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. So you have Jesus having authority to sit on this uh, 
this ass and the cult of full of an ass and coming into, uh, into Jerusalem and people recognizing him as Messiah. You, now you have him going into the temple and overthrowing tables. Then you see him after he's overthrowing the tables and, and calling out the people that are doing wrong, essentially saying the priests and the scribes and the people that oversee this place have done wrong. Now he's healing people. Does Jesus have authority over, over life and, and disease? Who agrees there's an authority thing going on here, right? Okay. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, they can't deny that, right? They saw these things happening. And the children crying in the temple saying, Hosanna to the Son of God. So these people that were doing it when he's coming into the, into the city, they follow him right into the temple. And as he's destroying all their money changing and making all this money, the people keep saying, hey, here's the Messiah. He's come to fix everything. And the chief priests are not happy. Are you with me? And, he said, and they said unto him, hearest thou what these say? They're basically saying, you're letting them worship you? And he said, <laughs> Jesus said unto them, yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? What are you saying? These people that don't know a whole lot are showing they know more than you do. <laughs> They're recognizing the Messiah. And he left them and went out into the city of Bethany and lodged there. So, you, so the disciples would have been there for all that. They would have seen this triumphal entry. They would have seen him having authority over the, saying he had authority over the religious priests, over the, what goes on in the temple, over healing people, even over nature. Look at verse 18. Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he hungered, and when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow then on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away, and the disciples saw it. They, what? They marveled, saying, How is this fig tree withered away? So there's authority over nature. Then you have authority over the Pharisees. I won't take time to read it, but if you go through 23 through 27, Jesus goes back to the temple and he's teaching, he's doing all kinds of things. The religious leaders come to him and say, they say to who does authority, okay, who's authority? This is, I told you I wouldn't read it. Go back to the 23. And when they came to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority do these things? And who gave us thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto him, I will ask you one thing. Which if you tell me, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, what, whence was it? From heaven or of men? Now let me ask you a question. You remember the list before. What was one of the things that the Jewish people believed would happen before the Messiah came? There was going to be a forerunner. When the Messiah came, was there a forerunner? What was his name? John the Baptist. So essentially, they would have understood, and the disciples would have understood, that when he asked, hey, who was John? What was his ministry like? They know that there's a whole bunch of people that believe in John, that trust in, and that's what it says, literally. And they reason within themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, why did you not then believe him? If this is ordained of God as a forerunner, if I say that John's the forerunner, if I say John's from heaven, I know Jesus could say that I'm the Messiah, and we didn't listen to John, we didn't like John. And so if we say we think that John's from heaven, we didn't obey John, we didn't follow John, we didn't believe in John, we didn't promote John. But if we say, verse 26... Of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. The consensus among the normal everyday people is that John was a prophet. And maybe then John is the forerunner, and that's why we can say to Jesus, you're Hosanna, save us now, we pray. So then Jesus says in verse 27, and they answered Jesus and said, we cannot tell. And he said unto them, neither tell you by what authority I do these things. You're like, man, you've got backed way up. Get what I'm saying. The disciples are here for all of this. He goes on to tell a bunch of parables. One of those parables 
is in chapter, I think, 22, talking about the parable of the tenants, where this husbandman had a field, and he worked the field, but then he goes on a far country, and there's people renting, they're using the field, and they're doing stuff for him, and he sends people to go get money from them because they stopped paying, they stopped paying for, and they beat them up, and then they keep beat them up. He's like, well, if I send my son, they won't kill my son, but then they send his son and they kill him. What is Jesus trying to say? You Pharisees are just like the people that killed the prophets. You think you're so big and bad. You think you're so righteous, I mean. You're, you're, killing, you, you're like the ones that killed the prophets. You say you would never kill the prophets. You kill, you're just like the ones that killed the prophets, and you're not even recognizing the son when he shows up. Is this about authority? That's what he's saying. And then chapter 23, he gives all these woes to the religious leaders. We get to chapter 23, verse 39, after Jesus just proclaiming woe after woe to these Pharisees. Again, the arguments about authority. He says in verse 39, For I say not unto you, shall see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. What he's saying is, you won't see me again until you recognize me as Messiah. Right? When you look at verse, uh, look at verse, I'm, I gotta get to Matthew here. Get, look at verse uh, 30, Matthew 23, verse 37. Here's the other part Jesus' pronouncement of a desolate Jerusalem and a desolate temple. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and sonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not, but your house is left unto you desolate. Before, Jesus said, you made my house a den of thieves. Now he's saying, I'm making your house desolate, and Jerusalem is going to be desolate. And you're not going to see me come henceforth until you shall say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So what am I trying to say? The disciples would have observed the triumphal entry, Jesus proclaiming to be Messiah, they would have already had three years of context of his ministry where he's healing the blind, healing the sick, teaching under his own authority. He's not always quoting scripture, although he does that. He's often teaching, hey, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. They understood that, being his authority, him being God. They recognized him being God. They recognized him being Messiah. And then they would have had this eschatology going, hey, this Jesus, this Messiah, he's here. We're in tribulation. We're under the subjugation of the Romans. Go back to that first list. Are you with me? We're in a time of terrible, number one, the coming of Messiah will be preceded by a time of terrible tribulation. Well, we're in that time. The Romans are over us. We're, we're, a, we're, we're a people that can't run ourselves. There was a forerunner. Well, hey, John the Baptist was the forerunner, right? They would have seen that. Number three, the Messiah would appear to establish his kingdom and vindicate his people. Hey, Jesus is here. We saw him calm the storm. He could take care of the Romans, right? What was Peter doing when Jesus was being arrested? He's taking a sword and trying to whack off the heads of the Romans, Right? That this is all born out of their theology. They're thinking, okay, this is about to happen. Jesus is coming to, He's clearing out the those Pharisees have been ruling long enough. Those priests have been ruling long enough. We don't need a priest when we got the Messiah. We're gonna have a king like David. And he's gonna take out all these Romans, all these people. And all the nations are gonna try to go against him. And we're going to win. To the point that that's what's 
instructing this particular discussion. Go to Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. So after Jesus pronounces all of this, do you think maybe the disciples are getting excited? We're on the inside of the guy that's going to come back to rule and to reign. Are you with me? They're pumped. I even heard somebody this week as I was studying this talking about Judas thinking, I'll just pretend to be one of his disciples because then I'll get a higher up position in the new kingdom that's coming. Are you with me? That's, that's some of the motivation going on here. So as they're leaving, having pronounced woe and all this stuff on these people in this temple, they're walking through and these guys are just enamored with Okay, Jerusalem's going to get destroyed, but then it's going to get rebuilt, and all these things are going to happen, and there's going to be a new heaven, and, and Jesus is our king, and, and we're going to win. And they're walking through, and they, verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for, for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, I don't know exactly how they reacted or responded, other than that just prompted more questions that we're going to see here in verse 3. But at that time, the temple was this astronomically gigantic edifice. The idea of people pulling down the temple would be like, without the the modern machinery that we have, like, how is that going to happen, right? And so... This, again, feeds right into their eschatology, which wasn't wrong. It's just all going to happen. They had no idea about this middle thing called the church age. They don't know anything about it. They think, I'm getting ahead of myself, but they think that there's no second coming, that there's only one coming. That one coming is just going to usher in exactly what's going to happen. So that's what prompts chapter 24, verse 3. And this gives you a a perspective on the disciples' questions, the questions that then prompt the Olivet Discourse. And i got to hurry, okay? Verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, so they left town, left the temple. This is sometime in the near immediate future. They're sitting down on the Mount of Olives where they can see the whole landscape of the city. They can see the temple. They can see all this stuff. And the disciples came unto him privately. We know later for sure Peter, James, John, and Andrew. From, from, I think Luke tells us that. Saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So there's kind of a couple questions in here, and some people argue about the phraseology of these questions, and that will give you different interpretations. Let's talk about the questions, and we'll save the answer for next week. We call that a bring y'all back kind of a thing, I'm going to tell you, okay? When? When shall, the question is when and what? When? And what? When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the age, the end of the world? The disciples definitely thought at this moment that the when would be very soon. I believe they thought this when could be immediate. There's some reasons I'm going to tell you why here in a minute. It just could happen at any time, it could be tomorrow. By the end of the Passover, for sure, he's already rode in on the donkey. He's already looking like he's announcing himself as Messiah. You're going to come and do these things when? When's this going to happen? I'm ready, Jesus. I can rule and I can reign. It's going to be great with you. This is going to be awesome, right? When? These things. What What are these things? This is referred to, this referred to what Jesus was talking about in the context. Context. He's talking about the desolation and destruction of the house of God and of Jerusalem. Again, 
talking about all the things that they think are, they think are going to happen at the second come, what we know as the second coming of Jesus, the Messiah coming to rule and to reign. The final work of the Messiah was to bring a culmination of his own kingdom. And the disciples had seen Jesus have authority over nature and people and demons and sickness and, yes, even death. Who remembers the raising of Jairus' daughter? Who remembers the raising of Lazarus? Right? They saw Jesus. They saw him calm the sea. They saw him walk on the water. They saw him have power over a tree to just make it wither. <laughs> right? They knew that Jesus was large and in charge, way bigger than what they, he was perceived to be by so many. And they knew he's coming back and that if the nations were to fight him, he's going to win. And so they're saying, when is this going to happen? They expected these nations to rise up against him to usher in his kingdom. And he says, what shall be the sign of your coming? How will we know when this is going to happen? The Old Testament has all kinds of sayings about signs and wonders. What, what's going to be, when Jesus came the first time, there were some signs, right? What were some of those signs? You shall see his star in the east, right? There were some signs, right? So they, they understood that there were going to be some signs. There were angels. So there, what's going to be signs? Are there stars, angels, trumpets? Here's the point. They saw this as a single coming. They saw this as Jesus, they didn't see a cross, they didn't see a resurrection, they didn't see an assembly, they didn't see Jew and Gentile to get, they didn't see that. You're like, well, what did they think when Jesus was talking about dying and resurrect? Well, what did they say? No, not so, Lord. Right? They just had no place, no category to put that in. They just dismissed it. That's why even after he resurrected, they're like, what's going on? <laughs> they don't even realize what's going on. Can you imagine how excited they must have been? They must have just been pumped. They must have been maybe most, the most excited these guys had ever been when they were following Jesus. Real quickly, man, I'm going to take up our prayer time. <laughs> Who remembers that there was strife between them because even at the Last Supper in Luke chapter 24, Jesus stops and says, you guys are fighting over who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. I'm going to tell you who's greatest in my kingdom, the one who serves, not the one who's being served, right? Remember when James and John's um, mom came and it's like, hey, who's going to sit right hand and like, make it so that my sins sit at your right hand and your left? And Jesus is like, you don't even know what you're asking. So, pretty crazy. What shall be the sign of thy coming? Even after the resurrection, they were asking these kind of questions. Real quick, Acts chapter 1. You got it? Acts chapter 1, is it on there? Acts chapter 1, look at verse number 6. I don't think it's on the screen. Look at it. Jesus dies. He's buried. He's resurrected. He teaches him all these different days. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of to what? Is it now? Okay. That resurrection thing was cool. You're definitely indestructible. So now you're going to do it? And what did Jesus say? It's not, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost to come upon you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? That word end is the word suntelia, which is used of a completion, the idea of 
end. There is completion or final culmination of a planned series of events. It's the idea that God is bringing history to a final culmination. Who agrees that's what God's doing? God, that's what God's doing. Right now, we don't know exactly all how that's going to work out. What does Joe Biden have to do with that? I do not know. Right? Are you with me? That's not me casting any kind of stone at any Paul. I'm just saying, that's how we think, isn't it? Right? How, is this, how does America fit into all this? How do, okay, I know this. God's working out his plan to a culmination. And what they were asking is, okay, Jesus, when is this going to happen? Are we ready? Is this now? What's the sign of your coming? The idea of coming there is perusia, the idea of presence and arrival. It's not coming in the sense of you, ha- you aren't here yet, so you're showing up. It's the idea of, well, Peter, James, and John are the ones asking, what did they see that nobody else had? What did they see on the mountain that nobody else did? The veil of his flesh brought back and him transfigured before them, which looks a lot like Jesus coming back on a horse with the sword coming out of his mouth. Are you with me? That's what they're thinking. Hey, when are we fighting? We got a ringer. When is this thing coming to a culmination where Israel's in charge and we, we're, on, we're going to see this thing come to a culmination. That's what they're thinking. So their question, and this is where we got to be, their question is about, truthfully, it's about the second coming of Jesus. They just didn't know it was about his second coming. They know it as the end of the world. When Messiah sets everything right. What is the sign of that coming to be? And to find out what Jesus said, you can read your Bible. (laughs) Or you can come back next week. Let's pray. God, I love you. Thank you so much for your word and what it means. God, I thank you. God, we believe you are coming back and you are going to set things right. I pray that you'd help us to not be so enamored with the things of this world that we're not looking up ready for you to come back. God, I pray now that as we go into this prayer time together that it would be a sweet time and that you'd use it in our lives to live on mission for you until you come. We love you. In Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. We're going to cut off the live stream now. And if anybody has any...